Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. My name is Alexandra Vakru, and I'm the Executive Director of the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard. Today's event is hosted by the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation and co-sponsored by the Davis Center. I want to start with a few brief announcements on the Ash Center's behalf. The Ash Center would like to acknowledge the land on which Harvard sits as the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people and a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. Today's event is being recorded and the video will be made publicly available on the Ash Center YouTube channel. You're welcome to submit questions anytime through the duration of the event. Please send them on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen instead of submitting them via the chat. I'm joined today in conversation with Tony Sage, Ash Center Director and Daewoo Professor of International Affairs. The focus of our conversation today is going to be on the crisis in Ukraine, China's response, and the future of the China-Russia relationship. Tony and I will spend about 30 minutes in conversation, and then we'll open it up to audience questions. And Tony, I have so many questions. <laughs> I'd yeah. like to start with, with what we know about um, China's to re reaction to the war. Now, rumor has it that when Putin went to Beijing for the Chinese Olympics, he asked he was asked to wait a couple of weeks until the end of the Olympics before launching the war. And I was wondering if you could give us any insights into what that conversation might have been like and what China was given to expect about Russia's plans. You know, the honest answer with all these issues, Alexander, is it's such a black box that we don't really know. We can sort of imagine what a conversation might have been like. I mean, it seems implausible that uh, the question of some kind of invasion into Ukraine wasn't touched on at least. I do think, though, there are some signals uh, from China's reaction that the severity of the Russian movements caught them by surprise. But of course, <clears throat> the lack of transparency means that really there's always going to be a suspicion that Xi Jinping really knew more than has been publicly revealed. My suspicion is that um, probably Putin told him that uh, you know, he was going to move in to the eastern parts uh, of the Ukraine because of the threats against uh, Russian nationals and supporters there, and it would be uh, quick, it would be clean, and it would be very quickly resolved. And uh, that I think has clearly caught the Chinese leadership by surprise, and it's made it a very difficult tightrope for them uh, to walk as they look uh, forward. So what are you seeing? I mean, as an expert, you're surely parsing what's coming out of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or various experts. What kind of um, sort of jockeying for narrative are you seeing among the, the Chinese? Well, you know, the official responses from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and elsewhere, of course, is hampered by the fact that uh, Xi Jinping declared Putin to be such a great friend that with the joint statement, there is no limits to this relationship. So it's very difficult for any official agency to shift too far away from that uh, narrative. I do think though, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has been trying to produce some wiggle room, if you like, uh, for China's response. But to be honest, its narrative hasn't really shifted from the beginning to the present day. Yes, it makes comments about uh, the terrible losses. It doesn't want to see civilians hurt. Uh, it does respect Ukraine's territorial uh, integrity, but it persistently uh, continues with the view that this is the fault of the West. It can't bring itself to say this is an invasion. Um, it can't uh, bring itself, obviously, to bring any critical uh, notion of what Russia is doing. And instead, always buried in its comments is the quest question that this is um, the need for Russia to have effective security on its borders. And what has destabilized this is not uh, Putin's actions, but it's the eastward expansion of NATO. And of course, the aggressive responses from the United States of America, the provision of wars, the rhetoric, so on and so forth. So if we look at it from that perspective, uh, China hasn't really changed its tune uh, since it began responding to this. Um, it does put out sort of placatory messages. Uh, it does defying all description of what is happening on the ground 
talk about its support for territorial integrity in Ukraine, uh, and it keeps continually talking about the need for a negotiated settlement. And then, of course, it, it's taking its normal practice at the United Nations that when there's a contentious issue, it abstains. One of the things that we've been noticing uh, in Russia is that the information that's available to Russian domestic audiences is extremely different from what we're seeing outside of Russia. So we don't have uh, the kind of firewall, or at least Russia did not have the kind of firewall that China had. And so people had access to Western avenues for information, although most people did not use them. What we're seeing now is a real crackdown that even using the word war is not allowed. You can only say special operation. And I was wondering what, uh, what the Chinese population is consuming in terms of information and what they know about what's happening. Well, again, you know, it's also a highly controlled environment. Um, China has been more strictly controlled uh, over internet access, uh, social media avenues than Russia has been. So one would not be surprised to see that the formal uh, media structure really follows quite carefully the narrative as laid out, uh, that this is more defensive. Um, it doesn't like to show on the national news uh, the terrible destruction which is being wrought. Having said that though, information does sit through. These systems are porous. And so you're seeing different reactions in social media, I think amongst Chinese citizens, which ranges from, um, you know, um, uh, saying we should take an example from uh, Putin. We should see this as an opportunity to invade Taiwan, seeing him as somewhat heroic. But also uh, related to that, there are critics uh, of what has been happening. Uh, there are views of those who are saying that uh, this is unjust, it's unfair, that uh, China is getting dragged into something that is not beneficial long term. And we did see a remarkable letter by five Chinese professors that was put online, which basically said, you know, this is not in the Chinese national interest. It needs to be stopped. Now, of course, it was taken down, but it was a, quite a while before it was taken down, which meant that it could be circulated uh, quite widely. So, um, you know, as a result, you know, across uh, Chinese uh, social media, you've got the official narrative, but you've got a lot of counter narratives also circulating, even if they do, you know, get shut down as quickly as they go up. So it clearly shows that people in China have a varied view of this. Some are disturbed about the long term consequences. Some are extremely supportive of what Putin has been doing. And some just uh, happy to go along with what the official narrative is. And are there are there demographic cleavages that you can identify in terms of these different narratives? For example, you know, is it the millennials that are um, more anti-war or, or any kind of trends like that? That's that's hard. I don't think we've seen any genuine analysis uh, of this. Um, my gut suspicion is that it might be a little bit like Russia, that uh, older people like myself are more likely to be sort of watching the television and therefore they're more likely to be seeing this sort of official story which is being told and going along with it. Whereas younger people like my kids, of course, they take their information online and you know they would split between those who are much more nationalistic uh, in their views and those who are probably more critical. So I think there you do see a wider range of debate and discussion uh, taking place. One of the questions that's long animated uh, Russia specialists is the integrity of the Russia-China relationship. And it's portrayed, it's not an alliance, right? But it is uh, a partnership uh, allegedly without limits, uh, one among equals. Um, and the anecdotal evidence I've heard is that the Chinese don't necessarily see it exactly in that light, but they're willing to go along with the Russian interpretation of that relationship. Could you describe a little bit how you see that relationship, the Russia-Chinese relationship, and whether this invasion, this war in Ukraine is going to, in fact, bring out some of the limits in this partnership without limits? Yes, I mean, it's clearly not an equal relationship. 
I mean, that is the dramatic shift that has happened progressively uh, over time. And we saw that also, um, you know, after 2014 uh, with the annexation of Crimea, where Russia became increasingly reliant on Chinese support, um, also trying to pick up things like taking more uh, LNG exports uh, to China, uh, importing more uh, perhaps cereal products, also um, investing in Russian companies to compensate. And if you look at the joint statement that was issued uh, when Putin and Xi Jinping met at the time of the Olympics, um, it's basically a manifesto for what China wants. Um, it seems to me it was mainly drafted by the Chinese side, uh, which I would imagine might irk Putin somewhat. Um, it gives China everything it wants, including a specific mention of Taiwan. It does not mention the Ukraine explicitly in that uh, joint statement, but it does include the uh, talking point, which has underpinned much of the official response from China about the security uh, guarantees uh, for Russia. So to me, I think the relation, I mean, some people have talked about this is the statement for a new uh, global order. And they did talk about it being marking a new point in history moving forward. I think the invasion of Ukraine has done that rather than this joint statement. But I still think to a large extent, the relationship is transactional than the notion of a deep uh, reliance. And Russia has become increasingly uh, dependent and will be increasingly dependent on China moving forward. And if we just look at the simple area of trade, for example, um, you know, Russia-China trade, it's something like around 15% of Russia's exports, maybe 20% of its imports. But the European Union is still overwhelmingly more important in that context uh, for Russia. And that does create an interesting situation of how much China is willing to accommodate uh, supporting Russia moving forward. And a lot of that will depend, I think, on you know, what happens subsequently in the Ukraine and the international response and how that may or may not affect uh, China moving forward. I mean, basically, China is going to pursue what is in its best national interest. What this has done for Xi Jinping, uh, which has been problematic, is that he wanted uh, stability over all else this year before his coronation at the 20th Party Congress uh, at the end of this year. And I think one of the last things he really would have wanted was an international conflagration, which is really going to roil uh, the global community uh, through much of the rest of the year. So let's talk a little bit about that, that relationship. I mean, as you point out, China is an important economic partner for Russia, but certainly not the most important, or it hasn't been. But the Western sanctions that have been imposed on Russia are going to make it almost impossible for Russia to do a lot of business with any other large partners. I mean, it's basically China, and we don't know exactly what will happen with India. Do you think that that China will step up and will absorb some of those uh, exports, Russian exports, and offer more imports of food and manufacturing parts and things like that? And, and wouldn't that really increase the dependence of Russia and of Putin on Chinese willingness to, uh, to play that role? Well, already one of the first things that uh, China did or China Customs announced was it was uh, lifting the restrictions on uh, Russian wheat, for example, which previously it had problems for, you know, phytosanitary concerns, and that's been lifted. There are also measures about, um, you know, expanding uh, pipeline capabilities for LNG coming into China. The challenge, I think, is going to be how Western sanctions are going to operate. So if I'm a Chinese company that is working now collaboratively with one of the companies in Russia that is uh, or falls under sanctions, um, will the Chinese company itself be impacted and will that affect the way it's going to operate? There were some rumors already floating that some Chinese companies were receiving 
advice uh, to be very careful about how they engage with some of those Russian companies. So we don't know, uh, but it's going to be an important thing to, to look at uh, in the future. And if the sanctions deepen um, and widen, it's going to be a major issue. I think the real shock um, for China in what has happened to date is the question around SWIFT. Um, and that, um, I think probably has shocked somewhat uh, the Beijing leadership because China is so heavily integrated into global financial markets. It's a $5 trillion engagement. Um, the West needs China in that sense, but China also needs continual access into global financial markets. And, um, you know, should, um, for example, in the future, something occur where China might be attacked uh, in terms of cutting off access to SWIFT, which is not going to be, of course, uh, related to the Ukraine issue, but it must be something that they might be thinking about. And I'm sure it's going to change their thinking about how they hold their reserves and where they hold their reserves moving forward so that they do not suffer from that kind of vulnerability. So I understand that actually both China and Russia have an alternative SWIFT system. Yeah. Russia's has about 400 banks. China's has, I think, 80 banks. Uh, SWIFT has 11,000 banks. Um, and given that these are kind of messages uh, or networks for direct messaging the banks, is it possible that the combination of the Chinese and the Russian alternatives to SWIFT allow at least relationships between those two countries, direct trade relationships to continue? It should do, I think is the answer to that. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I suppose the, the important question that follows on from that is can they persuade other countries to join their system? And so through that, be able to increase uh, its relevance and their ability to sort of carry out transactions independent of um, uh, going through the Western uh, dominated and overseen banking system. You know, it, it kicks on into other areas. You know, uh, some people have been talking about, can Russia use cryptocurrency, for example, uh, which is sometimes difficult to uh, oversee because of the libertarian nature of those involved in cryptocurrency but I heard someone saying this morning, well, but really to transact, you've got to transfer the cryptocurrency into a euro or a dollar, and that's probably where it would get blocked and stifled. So yes, it exists, but it's a very narrow kind of corridor at the present period of time. Also, there, there are different ways, of course, in which those American sanctions are going to bite. So one is being excluded from SWIFT and the messaging. The other is essentially being excluded from the use of correspondent banks in the United States. Yeah. So it, you could say it's only six or seven Russian banks that are being sanctioned, but they have 80 or more percent of the assets in the Russian banking system. So they're doing most of the transactions. And uh, my question is, are the transactions that are going between Russia and China also, do you think, using correspondent banks, like most transactions that happen to be in the US, or have they already set up some kind of direct banking relationships that could continue even uh, regardless of those sanctions? Yeah, my honest answer to that is I don't know. I mean, I've not seen anything that has been written about that or uh, any mentions of that to date, but It'll be an interesting thing, obviously, to watch, but it, it's really nothing that I actually know about myself. Has the Chinese Central Bank come out and said anything about the unprecedented sanctions on the Russian Central Bank? I think those have come as a shock, uh, certainly in Russia, given that it's the 11th largest economy in the world. It's not Iran or Venezuela or Syria. Right. Um, and, and I wonder how many central bankers really imagined that that kind of step was possible. Well, I don't think central bankers did. And, um, you know, it was, as you know, very contentious within the European Union and the US about whether they really would uh, take that step or not. And it was really only, I think, significantly after uh, Germany changed its position uh, that that actually went ahead. The responses from China at the moment and the head of the Banking Regulatory Commission, uh, Guo Shuqing, 
had dismissed uh, sanctions, um, had which I think is uh, you know basically reflecting the Chinese government's view, saying that no, uh, China was not interested in being involved in the sanctions. Sanctions do not work, and this was not an area that uh, China was interested in uh, uh, going along with, joining with, and saw no value in the sanctions. And I think that probably pretty much must reflect the official position from China. So China has has not wanted to get involved in in the sanctions and in the punishment of Russia. But do you think that there's a role that China could play in resolution of the conflict? Uh, you know, that's, again, a tricky question. Um, China has said consistently that it wants to see a negotiated settlement. Um, you know, the foreign minister spoke with the um, foreign minister of the Ukraine, uh, in which that was repeated. I mean, Ukraine has asked uh, and on a number of occasions for China's help in this issue. China, because of the things we've been talking about earlier, is probably what, about the only country that might be able to exert any influence on uh, Mr. Putin uh, related to this. Um, but even in the discussion that took place between um, uh, the Chinese foreign minister and the foreign minister of the Ukraine, yes, you know, we're distraught at, the, at what has been happening. We do believe in your territorial integrity, but then it was still followed up with a lot of the concern being, we hope you will protect our Chinese nationals in the country, a legitimate issue uh, to raise, obviously, and that you live up to your international obligations. But again, in that conversation, it was repeated that this is really because of his, the, you know, not understanding the historical context and the need for Russia to have its security space. So what, the only other information I've really seen was something reported in the New York Times that the Biden administration had contacted Beijing to ask for help uh, early on in restraining uh, President Putin, but that it hadn't been uh, positive in that and simply had passed the information on uh, to Moscow at that particular time. So it could play a role. We do know in other cases China has played a behind the scenes um, positive role in trying to deal with certain um, you know, global challenges, uh, you know, nuclearization on the Korean Peninsula, for example. We know that uh, China actually played quite a positive role in trying to deal with North Korea around that. So it is possible, but um, at the moment, uh, it's hard to know what would restrain Putin from pushing ahead with the actions that he's already undertaken and uh, deepening those uh, further. You mentioned that there are Ukrainian uh, nationals in Ukraine. There's, uh, oh, sorry, Chinese nationals in Ukraine. There's also been Chinese investment in Ukraine. I wonder if you could give us a sense for how actively China has been uh, investing in, in Ukraine and what they've been doing. Um, the... Uh... You know, Ukraine has been a major supplier of wheat to um, China. It's, uh, you know, China is one of its major trading partners. Um, there actually was a fairly good relationship. In fact, in January, uh, Xi Jinping uh, sent to Zelensky a congratulatory message, uh, you know, lauding their 30 years of uh, diplomatic re relations. So, um, there had been, uh, you know, growing and decent uh, relations between uh, the two countries in an economic sense. So this will be an issue of, uh, um, you know, will there be an economic upset through that? But, you know, China is large enough with enough alternative uh, sources to turn to that it can really substitute for anything that it was benefiting from uh, with the Ukraine is my general take on that. Is it, uh, is it an end to the Eurasian land bridge, you know, the Belt and the Belt and Road initiative? I don't think so. Um, you know, again, we're dealing with the imponderables because we just don't know what the outcomes of this are going to be. And it does depend, I think, importantly, 
on where we finish up uh, is some kind of when Putin has finished with what he wants to do, will he allow some form of the current administration to remain in place over parts of the Ukraine? Will he be putting in a puppet government? Will he pursue until the country is completely smashed and destroyed? I mean, all those improbables that we just don't know about would affect, I think, the outcome of something like that. Um, but, you know, a lot of the rest of Eurasia is um, very, um, I think, supportive of uh, increased infrastructure, linkages uh, that are going through their, their countries. Places like Kazakhstan have been clear beneficiaries from that, although Beijing might have been a little bit disturbed about the unrest there and the fact that Kazakhstan sort of turned to uh, Moscow rather than um, perhaps <clears throat> Uh, Beijing uh, when it was looking for help. Um, so I, you know, I don't see why that has to be an end to it, but it is so dependent on where things go. Do, do you think that China has an ideal outcome for, for what's going on in Ukraine? What, what do you think they would like to see? Well, I think their ideal outcome is already gone as a possibility. I think what they would have liked, I don't know. I mean, I'm not in Beijing, so, you know, it is in that sense a black box. I think, well, but if I guess, I would think what they would like to have seen was a quick, sharp slap on the wrist that, uh, you know, Putin, and this probably is what he may have told Xi Jinping, was that he was going to take control of those eastern areas uh, of, of the Ukraine, which you know, he tells the story of the persecution of the people there and that Russia would be a liberating force. It would be a peacekeeping force to come in there, that that is where it would have extended to along the lines of the annexation of Crimea. And then it would have wrestled some kind of statement out of Kiev that, yes, we will stay neutral under no circumstances. Will we join the European Union? Nor uh, will we allow NATO expansion uh, within our borders? That, to me, is what the ideal outcome would have been, and it would have avoided a lot of the opprobrium, uh, which we've seen subsequently, and the very difficult position that Beijing finds itself in. Um, So let's uh, turn to some of the questions that are coming in. I would remind everyone to please put your questions in the Q&A button and not use the chat, um, since I can't follow both. Um, and so this first question is, what impact do you think the Ukrainian crisis will have on the future development of U.S.-China relations? Well, they're pretty bad already, um, and they're not going to get better as a result of this. Um, no, the, I mean, the levels of mistrust between the US and China now run very deep. Um, you know, um, you could imagine a scenario where if Washington was able to talk to Beijing and Beijing was able to help with some kind of resolution to what Putin is doing, that might be an opening way for actually an enhanced and improved relationship between the two countries. It would be great. I think it's unlikely. I think this is going to really increase suspicions on both sides. I mean, we have to remember that uh, China views itself as um, being under pressure from the United States, uh, being constrained by the United States of America. And this is clearly just another example of US aggression globally, as far as they are concerned. That might be difficult for us to sort of consider, but I think you have to place yourself in the mindset uh, of the leaders in Beijing and the way they look out and see the world. And um, if you were sitting in Beijing and you looked around at, you know, where are military bases? You know, where does the United States of America have alliances around the world? You know, it would look pretty much like containment. And so I think this is just another example feeding into that perception that uh, whether true or not, that America seeks to undermine uh, China's rise and China's advance. So I think this is going to, you know, take the relationship between the United States and uh, China to an even newer low. 
Well, that's, uh, that's not good news. Um, there's another question here that China can't be appreciating the, uh, the nuclear bomb saber rattling that uh, Putin is doing. Um, could you talk about a little bit what uh, China's relationship to that would be and, and maybe to um, you know, nuclear arms control and, and issues that have not gotten on the table and perhaps should be in the near future? Mm. Um, well, I, yes, I mean, I, I, I agree with that, that comment. I mean, they must be disturbed by this. Um, China has spoken against uh, nuclear proliferation. Um, it is a major concern for it uh, in the same way that Washington is concerned by what uh, Putin has done in terms of raising uh, the level around that. I would think it's something that uh, would make China extremely nervous um, and you know, might want to talk uh, Russia down from. Uh, and that might be you know, a proverbial olive branch to be held out to the international community. Um, but as I said, on the whole, China over contentious issues does not like to be public. Uh, it prefers, you know, behind the doors diplomacy. And as I've said earlier, in the United Nations, it prefers to abstain rather than uh, be positive in support or veto uh, when there is a contentious issue. So I don't think we'll hear too much publicly about this issue, but I do think privately it must be a, a question of concern uh, to them because, you know, what are the knock-on effects going to be? Is Japan now going to decide, well, you know, we've held back for a long period of time, we've got the capability, you know, shall we now push ahead? Other countries might be recalibrating in other ways which could be dangerous and destabilizing, not just to the West, but also for the East as well. Do you think this might whet uh, China's appetite to participate in, in arms control negotiations? I don't know. I mean, obviously not at the present moment, right. because uh, you know, participating at the present moment is gonna look far too much like some kind of capitulation or support to the West, and it's not mm -hmm. going to want to upset Russia at that point. But I think you may be right that over the longer term, one hopes once this dies down in a more humane and better fashion, that it may be something that would stimulate China uh, to engage more proactively around these questions. So here's a, another question. President Macron is the only distinguished West, Western leader who's built a good rapport with Xi Jinping and is maintaining regular conversation with Putin. Could President Macron and Antonio Guterres reach out to Xi Jinping to prevent further bloodshed and bring Russia to serious negotiations, potentially leading to a permanent solution? I'm not sure. I mean, um, Macron has tried hard with Putin and it seems to have had no effect in terms of their discussions. Um, he has been very careful, as was Angela Merkel, earlier in terms of not demonizing Beijing. Um, you know, he said, you know, we shouldn't, I, I forget the exact phrase he used. Um, I don't think it was, we shouldn't humiliate Beijing, but it was something along the lines of, we shouldn't disparage Beijing. And Angela Merkel, of course, had said, uh, you know, we don't want the formation of, of new blocks. Um, but, um, so yes, in that sense, he has maintained a, a better relationship to, to both Moscow and Beijing. But again, I, I think at this stage, nothing is really going to happen until Putin is satisfied himself that he's met whatever his objectives are. We, we don't really even know what his objective is with what he's doing. Uh, and it's hard to think that he's going to listen and be pulled back um, until he satisfies himself that he's done what he wants to do. I mean, the criticism that came out in the General Assembly vote, uh, in the Security Council, the sanctions, and so on and so forth, none of that has been a deterrent. And if anything, it just seems to have strengthened his resolve. So we have a question about what is happening on the Russia-Chinese border. 
if anything? What, what has been the status of that border? Has it changed in the past, let's say, five or 10 years? Um, and have there been any recent developments since this crisis began that we know of? Not that I know of is the honest answer to that. Um, what we do know is it does seem that Russia, of course, has been moving troops from the Siberian area uh, to support in the West. Um, there are issues there. I mean, there was a border conflict back at the end of the 60s. Um, there, is, uh, there are issues over what is the real correct border there. I wouldn't say it's a major point of friction in the relationship, but it has on and off been an irritant in the relationship. And Russia, I think, has often been concerned about Chinese economic activities uh, in uh, its Far East and in Siberia. Uh, cases where um, Chinese farmers have been moving in, and I think there have been concerns about um, what China's economic engagement in the Far East of Russia might mean. But I haven't seen any uh, signs that that is playing into the current situation. And as I said, the only thing I know of, but maybe others have better information than me, and I'm sure they do, is just some of the troop movements away uh, from the eastern parts of Russia uh, to be supportive to the West. So if we, if we step back a little bit from the current crisis and the current border, there's always been a question in the, in the back of the minds of the Russians about whether it's entirely wise to be uh, getting closer to China, given that Russia has all of this largely unpopulated territory to the east, and China has an enormous population that may be in need of more territory in the future. Do you think there's any kind of long game here where the Chinese realize that if the Russians are dependent enough on China or need China enough to survive the current situation, that they may be able to swap uh, support for territory implicitly or explicitly? Uh, the answer to that is who knows. <laughs> I mean, it clearly, yeah, it clearly is, as I, as I indicated earlier, an issue. And, um, but both countries are so fixated on territorial sovereignty. So yes, while maybe China might want to move into uh, Russian designated space at the moment, does that fit with Putin's narrative as being a, the great protector, defender, you know, uh, taking back uh, to the days of the great Russia? Um, seems to me unlikely. Um, and, you know, think of it in the context of what uh, President Putin has said, that if we look back on the last century, the Holocaust, two world wars, whatever else went on, and he defines the greatest catastrophe of that century being the unwinding of the Soviet Union. So I think that says a fair amount about uh, what both uh, places would think about in terms of sovereignty and territory, at least uh, for the present time. If there's a long game, who knows? Uh, I don't think any of us are party to knowing that. So another question to which none of us are a party, uh, Russo, uh, no, Chinese-Indian relations. Mm. Do you think that, that this crisis and this um, sort of, let's say, at least it's a, a, well, has the crisis, do you think, changed the calculation that Beijing has when it looks at uh, broadening or deepening relationships with India? Well, India, of course, is the other country that has been abstaining. And... Um, it also enjoys a, close, a closer relationship with Russia. Um, so I think this might well play into uh, politics moving forward. I mean, we know, you know not so long ago, there was a border conflict between India and China, which really seemed to be heralding uh, a significant downturn in their relationship. Uh, but I think since then, we've seen more of a warming of a relationship um, uh, between, or at least the frosty relations uh, melting away to a more normal set of relations. And India similarly is treading not as much as China, because China obviously has entered into that much closer relationship with Russia, but India also treads a very difficult terrain between the pull from the US and the pull from Russia. 
And so this may well have some significant shifts in terms of relations from East Asia into South Asia. It might also therefore be somewhat disconcerting for uh, Pakistan, uh, for example, which is always, again, hovered between the US and China, but of course has always been um, close to China and of course was the bridge uh, for Nixon and Kissinger to get to China to actually reestablish relations. So I think we're gonna see a lot of unpredictability uh, around global affairs in the future. And as uh, you know, I, I don't remember who was, I was just flicking through something that was saying, whatever the outcome in the Ukraine is, global order and politics is going to be realigning for some time to come. Well, I think that everyone has been surprised at how effectively NATO has come together with uh, the United States to counter Russia in a unified sort of way. Do you think that this uh, resurgence of NATO's uh, raison d'être and um, unity might be leading the Chinese to think that they had better develop some kind of defense block of Asian countries? Well, I think there's two different aspects to that. Um, how long will the United States remain solid in terms of seeing NATO in a positive light? We had a president before this one who disparaged NATO, who didn't see a value in it, also didn't see a particular value in terms of the, um, some of the allies uh, in Asia. Um, so, including if I was in the European Union, if I was in NATO, I would still be careful because if one were to get another president after the next election, is all this capital that one is investing in this revival of NATO uh, going to endure? And again, I, if I was in Beijing, I would be watching that. You know, is this uh, brought by a particular moment with a particular president? but would it survive a change of the government in uh, Washington to a different political party or a different political leader? Mm -hmm. In Asia, it's very difficult for China. What is the military alliance it's gonna build? I mean, we, we do see this bifurcated world in Asia now where you, know, you have an economic Asia, as Evan Feigenbaum has said, which has China at its core, trade, investment, so on and so forth but you have uh, a security Asia, which still really has the United States of America at the center uh, of that, uh, with a set of alliances that, you know, China simply cannot um, uh, knit and build back together. Um, so, you know, the US always will have that strength of, of military alliances uh, around the region. I think one, question it might throw up is how will China think about security moving forward? Because if you think about it to date, China has rely, relied on the US global security umbrella for its trade, for its shipping, for its activities and so forth. Essentially, that is what it's relied on. If the relationship with the US deteriorates so badly, can it afford to do that? And does that mean it's got to build up much more strongly its own um, security uh, capabilities to protect its commercial shipping, its increasing investments overseas and so forth? And that might be something that uh, Chinese strategists uh, have been thinking about uh, seriously for some time. I have a question here that's related to that, which is uh, one of the things that we've seen is that it, it looks like Russia's difficulty in capturing Kiev or in being more aggressive in Ukraine is linked to problems in the military's preparation, planning, possibly corruption. Do we think that the Chinese military is in a much better condition, much more organized, if you will, than the Russian military? I think there's a couple of things that, uh, well, it depends in what context you're talking about that. I mean, I would say two general comments related to that is that if you war game, apparently Chinese military always does extremely well. Mm -hmm. um, but that's because they're 
war games. They're not reality on the ground. I think the thing we have to bear in mind is that the Chinese military has no experience of integrated uh, warfare on a battleground terrain. Now, what I, one might think about US military and what has happened, it has had consistently those experiences overseas, Afghanistan, Iraq, so on and so forth. And that's something that the Chinese military really lacks. And as we've seen with um, uh, Russia moving into the Ukraine, there is no substitute for real military engagement. And we've seen all the kinds of things that have gone wrong, supply lines, um, the, the kind of chaotic nature, the lack of communications, people deserting, so on and so forth. Um, and, uh, you know, real-time experience of that is extremely important. And that is something that China doesn't have. And what we do know of its more recent military incursions, they have not gone very well. You know, earlier 78, 79 in Vietnam was a disaster for China. We don't really know about um, India, but that didn't seem to go too well either. So from that sense, um, it's, it's sort of difficult to know how much more effective uh, a Chinese military might be. And if one thinks about where are they likely to be engaged militarily, of course, everybody turns to look at Taiwan. I would think if they look at what has happened with the land invasion um, into, uh, into the Ukraine and how difficult that has been for um, um, Russia, that must raise all kinds of questions about um, uh, an amphibious invasion into somewhere like Taiwan, which must be raising a lot of concerns about their military capabilities. So we said that we were going to leave the elephant in the room until the last 10 minutes. We are now here and we are on the elephant, which is Taiwan. Mm. And uh, I have lots of questions about that. I mean, I, I think the, the biggest question, the overall question is, will China, looking at how the West has reacted to the Russian war in Ukraine with incredibly intensive and swift sanctions, take away from that a reluctance to potentially move on Taiwan and incur the same economic problems? I'm not sure it changes the situation. I think, you know, you've seen online uh, some more extreme voices saying, you know, they should follow Putin and invade Taiwan. Mm -hmm. You don't see that from anybody in an official position. And I don't think, um, you know, Chinese leaders always have to include the phrase of saying, we will not ultimately rule out the use of force. But nearly always the emphasis is on trying to find a peaceful resolution to the situation with Taiwan. The question does come up, of course, about how long are they willing to wait uh, with this being pushed off into the future. But I don't think um, there is any intention from Beijing to invade Taiwan, uh, it would be an almost impossible task for Taiwan. It would probably be the end of the Chinese Communist Party if they did, just because of the kind of economic havoc that you're talking about that might be wreaked by sanctions, but also just because of what it would do in terms of trying to maintain uh, a military presence, you know, repressing uh, a very significant island population that would be very difficult to repress. And also, uh, at another level, I mean, they do see those as Chinese brothers and sisters. And if you're killing them, how does that go down in terms of domestic propaganda? So I think it's a very distinct issue from this question of the Ukraine. Um, I think um, even though some people have tried to link it together, um, but um, I don't, you know, China clearly doesn't, or people in Beijing clearly do not think that it's a, a linked issue. And also, of course, for Beijing, it's a totally different issue. Ukraine is a sovereign country. As far as Beijing is concerned, Taiwan is not. It's an integral part uh, of the mainland. So I think they don't want to draw those parallels. And that's why I think in the joint statement, uh, they were explicit about mentioning Taiwan, 
but not about mentioning uh, Ukraine in that joint uh, statement uh, that was made. Uh, but potentially one of the problems is similar, right? I, I, I take the, uh, the argument that, that Beijing is looking at these differently, but the problem of um, taking over a population that is culturally very similar to yours and can probably speak to you while you're invading them turns out to be extremely difficult. Uh, if one of the, um, if, if nothing else, what we're seeing with the, the the interaction of the Russian soldiers and the Ukrainian population is that it's it's very difficult for them to be making advances, um, given that they really do understand each other. And also, of course, the family relations from, uh, you know, between people in Russia and those in Ukraine. And, you know, you're talking about um, channels of information that people have. And of course, that's one that we haven't mentioned, that many people have friends and relatives in the Ukraine who must be, and we know, are sending them pictures and they're sending them stories, which of course is creating a, you know, concern amongst those people in Russia. Why are we doing this? How are we doing this? And you, know, you have, of course, across the state, straits, uh, considerable economic interaction you have a lot of personal travel that was taking place before COVID, uh, a lot of people studying in the mainland, uh, a lot of mainlanders liking to visit uh, Taiwan. So many of those factors would also uh, be present uh, in, under those circumstances with respect to China and Taiwan. So we're coming uh, soon to the end of our hour. And I was wondering if you could give us a sense of what we should be looking for in terms of China's reaction to what is happening in Ukraine? What are you looking for going mm -hmm. forward? And uh, where do you see that there are potential uh, risks for China in what happens next? Well, the potential risk for China, I think, is being too closely identified with Moscow's interests and in getting sucked into the, the backlash around the sanctions, uh, which could affect it. And that's a generally deteriorating relationship, not just the United States of America, but with many of the countries within the European Union uh, and beyond. So that is a, is a clear problem and a risk for it. Um, I think, you know, obviously what, what Beijing would like to see is this settled quickly uh, and, some kind of um, stable situation to evolve out of it. At the other end of the spectrum, if we're talking about is this relationship transactional or is it something deeper? I think there are three things that one could really look at uh, from Chinese actions, which may say that it's tipping much more strongly into an active support for Russia and its actions. And the first would be that it actually used a veto in uh, UN resolutions rather than abstaining, which kind of gives it the space to say, um, you know, still, you know, we, we accept Russia's legitimate concerns as we identify them, uh, but we're also uh, saying that we uh, uh, support uh, Ukraine's right to exist. So. If it tipped over to veto and away from abstaining, I think that would be a clear sign. I think a second clear sign would be if uh, Putin installs a puppet government, would uh, Beijing move to recognize it? How swiftly would it move to recognize it? And how uh, soon would it move to recognize it? I think that would be a second important indicator. And the third, which is something that uh, Beijing has been reluctant to do to date, is that even when it is so apparent that civilians are being killed and cities attacked and being bombed, uh, that China still refuses to call it uh, an invasion at that particular time. So I think those are sort of things to look at on, on that end of the spectrum. Is this relationship really much deeper? Uh, and really the no limits in the joint statement actually have some bearing and some relevance to this relationship moving forward. Or are we looking at a situation where um, China does not throw its lot in so obviously with Russia, maintains some space for itself, and it, does it at some point not see its national interest 
uh, coinciding so obviously uh, with that of Moscow. I mean, I think, you know, there is criticism in China of how rapidly the relationship with the United States has fallen into distress. Now, of course, much of that is blamed on the United States uh, for its actions, but also some are puzzled about you know, some of China's actions that have also brought this relationship to a low level. But Beijing also recognizes, as I think Washington should, that the two countries can't do without one another. There are just too many global problems that need collaboration between the two powers. Whatever Beijing might think of Washington, whatever Washington might think of Beijing, we have a whole set of issues around global commons, global regulations, and so on and so forth, that really require um, the two countries to be able to come to some kind of agreement and some level of cooperation. So I don't think Beijing will want the relationship with Washington to deteriorate uh, too far that it becomes impossible to salvage it. So would that imply that um, China does not have to worry about potentially being sanctioned in the future for whatever it does to the same extent as Russia is being sanctioned? I mean, there does seem to be the idea that you know, Russia is not, I mean, it's a big economy, but it's not hugely interconnected with all of the other players in the global economy the way China is, and that that is some insurance for China in terms of giving it more scope for maneuver. Well, and for the West, I mean, as you said, I mean, the two, you know, despite all this talk about decoupling um, and, you know, China has a risk mitigation strategy with what it talks about trying to decouple from certain elements uh, of the of the global interaction and concentrating more on its own domestic capabilities, which to some extent, you know, with the 1.4 billion population you can do, but there's areas where it really neither can really afford to be totally decoupled. I mean, American business in you know, 2020 sold $250 billion worth of goods in China. Wall Street is salivating at the idea of becoming involved in Chinese financial markets. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, China's global interaction uh, financially is a $5 trillion uh, business. Um, you cannot unwind that uh, too easily. And I think um, while they say, yes, there might be some pain with um, uh, what's gonna happen with Russia, it's gonna be much more significant to China in terms of that with the relationship with China. But most importantly, it's also gonna have a massive impact on a whole range of other countries in Southeast Asia and beyond uh, if you know, those kinds of sanctions were going to come uh, from the West uh, against China. So it's going to be a much more difficult uh, area to um, uh, navigate and negotiate. Thank you so much, Tony. This was a fantastic conversation. I want to thank the audience members for a terrific set of questions. And uh, I hope that we can do this again um, in order to further clarify the, those linkages and those relationships between China, Russia, and the rest of the world. Thank you so much. And thank you, Alexandra, and thank you, everybody, for all the comments and questions.